Welcome, everybody, to episode 26 of Generation Jihad. I'm Tom Jocelyn, and I'm here once again this week with my comrade in arms, Bill Rojo. Bill, say hi. Hello, everyone. Um, we're recording this shortly after the anniversary of the 9-11 hijackings. It's been 19 years already, which seems incredible, uh, surreal in some ways. Right, Bill? It just seems bizarre yeah. that we're this far out from that event. Um, I, you know, The world has changed, of course, a lot in that time. Uh, changed pretty much every way you could think of, I would say. Uh, but, you know, we're still talking about jihadism and Al-Qaeda and ISIS and, and sort of this thing is still going to a certain degree, in certain ways, I should say. Not to a certain degree, I think in a large degree. Uh, but we're going to talk about that and what, what we can actually say about jihadism and Al-Qaeda, you know, now a little bit more than 19 years after 9-11. Um, the first thing that comes up, Bill, is that on the anniversary of 9-11, Al-Qaeda released a message from Ayman al-Zawahiri and an English translation of the third issue of One Uma, their, one of their publications. And now we think this this production on a 9-11 anniversary was bizarre, right, Bill? It was sort of strange, right, for yeah. what Al-Qaeda decided to put out. Um, it's not what I expected of uh, Al-Qaeda celebrating 9-11, which obviously we'll get into. But yeah, I, I, bizarre, strange, weird. I think that all perfectly describes this message yeah I'm, I'm sure we could look up an online the source and come up with a bunch of different yep. other way, <laughs> ways of, of describing <laughs> it but but zawi here's message so to put it in contrast so like last year so we're talking about now in 2019 zawi put out a lengthy message which was basically a long rebuttal to the islamic critics of the 9-11 hijackings because of course there are many within the, the broader islamic community or islamic world muslim theologians and scholars who objected to the 9-11 hijackings, and Zawahiri was very angry, basically, with his Islamic critics. And so in 2019, he released this long, sort of, at times meandering, but at times, I think, uh, strongly reasoned argumentation against those Islamic critics, basically saying that they had the right to take the war to America, and if you don't like the choice of the World Trade Center as a target, well, what's your problem with hitting the Pentagon or other U.S. military targets? And Zawahiri basically called on Islamic scholars to issue fatwas to justify violence against U.S. military targets wherever they could find them. But um, what I would say is that it showed that Al-Qaeda was still sensitive to the aftermath of 9-11 and to the criticisms, the criticisms of it that it still receives of it, the fact that Zawahiri put this out. But that whole message, the bottom line is that whole message was focused on 9-11. Now that you come to this year, Bill, right, and we get this message from Zawahiri, which is not themed, themed its theme is not 9-11 related. It's not tied to 9-11 at all. Um, in fact, it's just this long um, diatribe or angry sort of rebuttal of an, Al out of an Al Jazeera documentary that was put out in 2019. I mean, it's just really strange, right, Bill? And Yeah, yeah, not, not what I would expect. I mean, it's very defensive um, in all of the issues that he draws. He's, he's how he's on the defensive here. Yeah, it was, it, was, it, was defensive. it was defensive last year on 9-11, but now it's defensive with a, when it comes to a piece that appeared on Al Jazeera. And this right. Al Jazeera documentary that came out last year, a film, uh, you know, I've only seen some clips of it online, um, basically, they had some alleged former Al Qaeda operatives who claimed one in particular claimed he was hired by the uh, Kingdom of Bahrain, the monarchy there, to suppress Shiite dissidents to go out and attack Shiite dissidents, and it's sort of implying or arguing that um, Bahrain and Al Qaeda were in cahoots, and that Bahrain was basically sponsoring Al Qaeda to, to carry out these attacks. And there were several other points that Al Jazeera has sort of produced along these this, along these same lines. There was this sort of this. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if it was the same documentary or somewhere else, but Al Jazeera reported that um, you know a former CIA intelligence officer had claimed that Abu Zubaydah, um, a guy who was who worked for Osama bin Laden and Al Qaeda's upper echelon prior to 9/11, contrary to what you might read in some other sources, um, that this claim from the CIA officer, former CIA officer, was that Abu Zubaydah had uh, was basically cozy with three different Saudi royals, and then when he was captured in 2002, he had contact information for them. Zawahiri is very upset about that being reported on Al Jazeera. Um, none of this is directly tied to 9-11. None of this is directly tied to justifying Al-Qaeda's mission in the world. It was all, as you say, Bill, very defensive. Um, now, we can only speculate why that is, right? We don't really know why this thing was put out. But it seems like they must be, Zawahiri and Al-Qaeda must be concerned that this Al Jazeera production had a negative impact on their brand and on how they're perceived by somebody, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, it has to be. I mean, it, I, uh, it makes no sense for him to go at Al Jazeera this hard. I, I can't come up with any other conclusion, Tom. Well, in, in previous years, we know that Al Qaeda actually has relied on Al Jazeera to put out its messages, and even even you know one of the uh, Bin Laden files, one of the memos recovered in Bin Laden's Larry's talks about getting materials to Al Jazeera on the anniversary of 9-11. Um, so it's sort of an interesting turnabout here on this, that basically in the past, Al Qaeda has relied on Al Jazeera to put out some of its messages or thought that it would basically get a fair hearing in, the, in, their, in their world. Um, and now you have Zawahiri railing against Al Jazeera. Um, you know, the other thing about this message is, you know, there are two, two things I thought that were interesting about it. Well, three things. One, it was put out on 9-11, even though it's not tied to 9-11. Um, it's put out... Um, it's part of a new series, basically that they're gonna ha- they're gonna put out, which is uh, titled "Deal of the Century" or Cru- or "The Crusade of the Century," and the theme of this is basically, you know, now you have the U.S. and the Trump administration is is attempting to help Israel broker these sort of deals, these this normalization of uh, uh, this uh, normalization of relations with various countries throughout the Gulf. You had that with the UAE and now with Bahrain, and so obviously there's a tie in to recent events with Bahrain in particular, and this. This message, you can see that there's a, a clear reason why Al Qaeda, which probably produced this message, produced this video, or had this video in production some months ago, um, decided to release it now. You can see that the timing of that is, you know, probably not coincidental with what's going on in the news cycle when it comes to is- Israel's relations with the U- uh, UAE and then Bahrain. And basically, this whole thing is to basically show. Um, this, this series looks like it's basically going to be aimed at saying, look at all these Gulf actors, look at all these countries that are sort of selling out. We Al Qaeda won't sell out. And and basically that's the first part of it. Right. Right, Bill. That makes sense. Right. We understand. Yeah, that, right. right. And Al Qaeda doesn't want to be linked, obviously, to Bahrain in any way, which is cutting a deal with Israel. I mean, that's definitely, you know, where this is all going. And that's the second part. The second point yeah. about this is that basically the whole thing is a lengthy rebuttal of the idea that Al Qaeda works for various uh, governments. Um, that it's you know, and and you have seen different theories of this. I mean, one of the more bizarre theories is that because Zawahiri was temporarily detained by the Russians in the mid 1990s, they some somehow secretly working for Putin's security services. I never found that compelling at all. Uh, I think there's little to no evidence to show that that's true, other than the suspicious circumstances of his arrest and release at the time. Um, but beyond that, there's nothing that you can really point to that that is actually firm evidence in that regard. Um, you know, now we've dealt with Al Qaeda's relations with other states as well, other nations as well, and this gets to a point. So, basically, Zawahiri is saying we're not a client of any government around the world or any nation state around the world, which is true. You and I agree with that. We don't think they're a client of any government around the world. They're not the typical terror proxy like Hezbollah works for the Iranian regime. You can't say the same thing with Al Qaeda with any regime, right, Bill? We, we no, we, I, I, I can't. I mean, look, they'll they'll cooperate at times. I mean, that is certainly clear. We we've documented numerous times where this has occurred yemen and and mauritania you know, cut a deal things like that but they're not gonna they are not gonna be subservient they've they learned their lesson after the the problems in the sudan in the 1990s that they can't rely on states to um take care of them they have to be independent yeah they you know it's it's i'm glad you brought up mauritania because that's the that's one of the least controversial states we can talk about their actions with because yeah. nobody's nobody's posited an invasion of mauritania or has, or has talked about you know the u.s taking right. military action in mauritania so it's, it's an easy way to sort of get around all the 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 sort of uh politicized and venomous discourse in washington let's talk about al-qaeda's relationship with mauritania let's talk about that in a second um but first you know Looking at um, why he's saying this and why he's arguing this, it's true that Al Qaeda does maintain relations with various countries, and they have um, various um, jurisprudence in the files you can see and in their statements that, that justifies this. You can see this in Bin Laden's files. You can see this in other sort of uh, documents they put out. But it's also true, as you say, that they don't want to be beholden to any country. And I, I was when I was reading reading through the transcript of what Zawahiri was saying and watching the video. I thought of the um, one of the lectures that Abu Musab al Suri, this Al Qaeda affiliated. You know, again, there's a whole torturous dispute over whether or not he was really Al Qaeda or not. <laughs> we're we're going to sidestep that. Um, but you know, Abu Musab al Suri's teachings are still relied on by various entities with, across Al Qaeda, including sometimes in Zawahiri's own videos. And in, in his lengthy track that he put together on all this, one of the historical examples that he used was basically how the Syrian Muslim Brotherhood was co-opted by Saddam Hussein's regime in the early 1980s during the uprising against the Assad family. And basically, you know, how the Mujahideen and the jihadists want to avoid a similar fate going forward. Um, you know, now it's interesting because it shows that Saddam Hussein was willing to work with Islamists and 
even sometimes jihadists, uh, contrary to what some people may argue. Um, but you can see this concern is a long-standing concern for Al-Qaeda. They don't want to be co-opted by any government. They don't want to be have to basically be beholden to any government. Um, so, and, and you point the example of the Sudan bill. I think that's exactly right. Uh, you know, they, they had all sorts of problems there that arose. Um, problems that we have not seen arise with the Taliban, by the way. Not that we have to you know, interject that again. Um, but... Um, so we haven't seen th- those problems ar- arise with the Taliban. We do have seen them problems arise in other cases. But be that as it may, so they don't want to be a client. But, and this is where this sort of gets a little tricky to discuss, they're not the typical you know, terror proxy of a nation state, but they do maintain relations with various states in various ways. Uh, they do cut deals. You mentioned Mauritania bill. Now here's a great example, right? So we know from bin Laden's files and then subsequent evidence from other sources that Al Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb did cut a deal with the government of Mauritania, and basically it was a you know sort of a quid pro quo. You know, Al Qaeda wasn't going to attack inside Mauritania in exchange. They'd have the rights to proselytize, and the government of Mauritania would basically stay, wouldn't arrest their people or detain their people, and would allow allow basically AQAM to use it as a rear base. That's not surprising to you, right, Bill? This is the type of thing that Al Qaeda has a flexible sort of ideology when it comes to this type of thing, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it doesn't just because they're cutting a deal that's extremely favorable to Al Qaeda doesn't mean they're in the pocket of the Mauritanian government. I mean, it's it, as a matter of fact, I think it shows just how weak the Mauritanian government is and how fearful it is of Al Qaeda and how powerful Al Qaeda actually was to be able to cut such a favorable deal. So, um, if if anything, I mean, it it it's. Al Qaeda flexing its its muscle, not a, a sign of weakness or or subservience, and not in any way. I, I, I can't read it any other way, Tom. Yeah. Now the other thing that that sort of is so Mauritania is less controversial, of course, because it's not tied to any of these highly politicized debates in Washington. But let's talk about a country that is tied into all these politicized debates in Washington, ideological debates in Washington. That's Iran. And uh, we, always, we, we've we been teasing an episode on the Iran Al Qaeda relationship. We're going to have that eventually. I promise. I promise we're going to do it. Um, but, uh, you know, as soon as we, you know, uh, get our act together and get it done. We've also, by the way, in the last week, Bill, I should tell listeners, we experienced some technical difficulties along our journal, which has held us up a little bit. We had some sort of crash of the server or hack or something. I, I don't know. You know, I'm a techo- technophobe. So. I don't really know, any, know anything about any of this stuff, but uh, we were down for a couple of days around 9-11, which is somewhat embarrassing, I would say, right? Yeah, embarrassing and frustrating. Let's get the thesaurus out, Tom. We yeah, can, uh, we can come we'll, up with more terms. We'll figure out. We'll figure out a. We'll figure out a way to solve that going forward. Uh, but we have people that don't like us that have tried to hack us a number of times, and then we have just sort of uh, you know people who are miscreants who are sort of up to acts of mischief. I don't know what this was, but the bottom line is we were offline for almost three days, which is not 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 so nice. Um, but let's talk about Iran a little bit here, too, because um, when when Zawahiri says, look, we're not the clients of any government, and he says, look, we've been accused of, of basically being in the service of, and he lists all these governments, one of them is Iran uh, that he lists. Um, and the reason for that is there actually is a another quid pro quo there, and this quid pro quo the, the, was established by the Obama administration, which had no interest in going to war with Iran and sought detente with Iran. It was the Treasury Department and State Department under Obama that established a series of official terrorist designations and other statements. The fact that there's this quid pro quo between the two and Al-Qaeda has a facilitation network inside Iran uh, that the Iranian government allows to exist. Um, so there is, again, This is does this mean that Al-Qaeda is in the pocket of Iran or is a client of Iran or a proxy of Iran? No, right? Uh, in fact, you could, you could point to all sorts of ways, and we have at Long War Journal, in which the two are at odds, and the two have fought each other and have problems with each other, particularly in Syria and Yemen, and just sort of, you know, this uh, Al-Qaeda's kidnapped Iranian diplomats at times to force exchanges. You can see some of the complaints in the Bin Laden files about what Iran is doing to Al-Qaeda veterans who are, in, who are inside Iran. But this sort of duplicity, this sort of, uh, you know, double dealing that you see, where on the one hand, they could be opposed to another another. And you can see Bin Laden was certainly concerned about Iranian influence throughout the broader Middle East. You can see that, and he put forth a basic plan for countering it even. Uh, even, even when you have those tensions and those problems, it doesn't stop them from colluding in certain ways. And this is sort of a nuanced analysis that I think, uh, certainly in Washington, where, you know, everything is stupid, you're not going to get a very nuanced analysis of this, and you, you run real, real to a caricatured version of it very quickly. But none of, all that said, Zawahiri is right that Al-Qaeda doesn't work for Iran. Yeah, absolutely correct. I mean, as you noted, there's been numerous conflicts between the two. But at the end of the day, they um, cut deals to 
uh, you know, to further attacks on the United States, the American right. forces, you know, no, yeah, right, yeah, yeah U.S. interests, basically, Com- common too. enemies, basically, wherever yes, they have exactly. Them, yeah. Well, the U.S. interest part is the, actually the most is the most controversial part, and we'll save that for the podcast. But the bottom line is, you can see that they at least, at the very minimum, allow Iran does allows Al Qaeda to have this facilitation network on Iran. So this is going to play into the next part of our segment here when we talk about this op-ed that was posted that we're going to respond to a little bit. Um, that's why I'm bringing it up here. Uh, but let's let's use one more example, um, Pakistan. So, uh, you know, is Al-Qaeda in, you know, we, we see this sometimes in the comments and people commenting on us basically portraying Al-Qaeda as a proxy of Pakistan. Again, I think it's a more complicated story than that. Um, this is not to absolve Pakistan at all, but it's the wheel of jihad, which we've discussed, where certain parties that are allied with Al-Qaeda or, or tightly wound up with Al-Qaeda are in fact um, allied with the Pakistani state or parts of the Pakistani state and have been for many years now. Um, and that provides this sort of milieu or environment in which Al-Qaeda can operate at times. Um, but by the same token, Al-Qaeda has tried to turn parts of this jihadi Frankenstein back against the Pakistani state. Um, think about the Pakistani Taliban or other parties. And then to add more complexity to the story, you have in Bin Laden's files, you show that Al-Qaeda was willing to have a truce with the Pakistani government. Um, basically, you don't attack us, we won't attack you, and let's, we just want to focus on the Americans, leave us alone. And certain Pakistani officials were willing to entertain that and go forward with that. Um, so again, this shows a much more complicated and nuanced vision of Al-Qaeda than what people, I think, typically want to believe about the group. Yeah, Tom, you know, for, for a group of people that constantly want to tell us that there's a lot of gray, that this isn't, you know, terrorism, and a bunch of issues aren't black and white, they certainly want black and white here. Either the Al-Qaeda, it has to be a, a direct proxy or it, or it has zero relationship. And, you know, it again, as you said, it's much more nuanced, it's much more complicated than such binary, you know, simplistic analysis. Yeah. And I, I agree. And you have to kind of look at it that way. You know, I mean, all the times, you know, you look in these different files from Bin Laden's compound. Again, you know, I had somebody ask me, you know, have you guys gotten around to doing that Bin Laden's file, Bin Laden files episode? That's what I wanted to do for the 9-11 anniversary. I wish we had, but again, we had ran into multiple hiccups this week, uh, you know, technical and otherwise. And I'm trying, trying to script that out so it's very tightly focused so we can show what he was doing during the last year of his life. And, and maybe we'll save that for next year or maybe we'll do it this year. I, as soon as we get it done, we're going to have it out. But Bin Laden, you know... He was a conspiracy theorist. He had all sorts of, of, of uh, wacky ideas, I would say, about how the world works. By the same time, by the same token, he had a very sophisticated view of of interacting with various governments and parties. And you know, they were they were looking to basically neutralize enemies wherever they could to keep their jihad um, advancing. Basically, they don't want to take on the world. They don't want to fight every party in the world because they see that as a losing effort. And they want to sort of, you know, make somebody, as he said, you know, sort of have some of these parties become neutral. Um, and so they've attempted that at various times. And that, that was sort of the reticence when it came to Iran, too, by the way. Despite the tensions between the two, they haven't declared all-out jihad against Iran, have they? No. No, they, no, they haven't. Tom, and I wanted to share one more example. I sure. don't, don't mean to, to no, dwell go for on it. it. Yemen's a perfect example where you have, yep. you know, multiple parties. Al-Qaeda, which took over large areas of southern and central Yemen, uh, twice over the last decade, from 2011 to 12, and then 2015-16, um, it obviously took that from the the um, the recognized government of Yemen. It also has teamed up with them in certain battlefields in Hidea and to fight against the Houthis, which are Iranian backed. So you have, you know, it's it's, and we have documented evidence of of this of Al Qaeda groups um, fighting alongside. Uh, um, you have many military formations, and it, it's it, you know again, this is extremely complicated. They're again, they're going up against Iran in in this case, um, and yet the, these type of local battles, because uh, of course the Iranians back the Houthis in in Yemen, and these type of local battles don't sort of don't uh, get in the way of that uh, more strategic relationship or agreement, whatever between Al Qaeda and Iran. It's it's almost like everything's fair game in the local theaters. And as long as Al Qaeda is not conducting attacks inside of Iran, everything's good to go. Yeah, you know, it's good. I'm glad you pointed to Yemen because there's a whole story with Yemen too, uh, going back to President Saleh's regime, mm-hmm. um, you know, which was overthrown. Um, you know, Saleh was a duplicitous character. He was another duplicitous American ally who, you know, you have 
various pieces of evidence showing that his political security office and his internal security forces were colluding with al-Qaeda at different times. There's a guy um, who ended up at Guantanamo who was accused of being a Yemeni political uh, security official of some sort and was also at the same time, you know, basically in bed with al-Qaeda. Um, that's another story for another episode. But the point is, is that you can point to all sorts of these complex relationships that sort of people don't want to really deal with because they raise all sorts of, of problems for how you execute policy, I think, and this type of stuff. And, and here's the bottom line from my perspective when it comes to this. We should be able to talk about al-Qaeda's relations with various governments or states. Um, we haven't even talked about Turkey. That's another complex topic, right? <laughs> right. There's, right. All, there's all sorts of these. You, should, you should be able to talk about that, including Iran, without running to this idiocy of, well, you're just trying to justify a military invasion yeah. or something like that. I mean, it's just so stupid. I mean, the, the bottom line is you need to have a uh, way of looking at this, it's factual, that bifurcates sort of, you know, the facts of what's going on from your preferred policy course. Because quite frankly, in a lot of these cases, and all, and maybe even all these cases, I wouldn't really entertain using military forces, the prime instrument to solve it, or the instrument to solve it at all uh, at this point, or even in the past. You know, I wrote, you know, we're going to talk about this on the Iran al-Qaeda episode. I wrote something in 2007 where I thought a war with Iran would be disastrous, you know. Um, and I, I stand by that. So the, the, the bottom bottom line, I keep saying the bottom line because I'm trying to distill this complex topic down to a very simple thing. The point is Al-Qaeda is a pretty interesting, nuanced entity and an and enemy for America. And we still find that the conversation about Al-Qaeda is really does not reflect so many facts and so many details this far in, 19 years after 9-11. Right, Bill? Yeah, right. And how are we supposed to you know create, uh, strat- execute policy against um, al-Qaeda and, and, and dealing with local governments when you don't have a full understanding of what is happening. If you tune this stuff out, if you pretend it's not happening, then and then you go to execute policy, you're going to you're going to have huge problems. This is the problem with in, in Yemen is a really good example with um, we backed Salah and he meanwhile, he's backing al-Qaeda and in, in cooperating with al-Qaeda in certain ways. And, and then the country falls apart. He was not the person we probably should have been working with. And and yet we fall into these policy traps because we fail to we we don't go into these situations with open eyes. We're just we're well, we're, I, well I think I mean, Salah obviously gave us cooperation against al-Qaeda at times, too. But the problem is that there is there a lot of times there is for my for you there's no there's no easy answer i mean you know what are you going to do in a lot of these cases you know i you know i mean uh you know i think you'd have to be you know you're dealing with an enemy that's organized as insurgents they are insurgents principally you we're not going to run counterinsurgencies in all these different countries we weren't going to run counterinsurgencies in all these different countries when there was yep. a peak appetite for military intervention right uh, you right. know and we're now at a at a we're now at the valley of the appetite for military intervention so we're certainly not going to run counterinsurgencies now and nor would I advocate that I didn't advocate that at the peak either in all these places I thought we sort of should have focused on the wars we were in as opposed to trying to you know solve all these other conflicts um, but you know, if you got to pick some local allies to choose and pick and try and uh, try and achieve something, and that's really part of what I think um, we keep talking about the endless wars rhetoric. Part of what I think is problematic about it is that you know people don't realize that America already is in a position of just trying to find local allies to work with to keep the jihadis at bay. That's really where we're at, and trying to stand them up and help them in some way. It's not about large scale military interventions anymore, and it hasn't been for a long time. And the question is, can the U.S. military maintain a small footprint, a low casualty, lower cost footprint that achieves some of these results? I think that's really the question. Um, and the endless wars rhetoric is sort of still a response to the Iraq war and everything else, which is in the rearview mirror now, really, in a lot of ways. You know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, it's almost like they need to execute full withdrawal from Iraq and Af- Afghanistan to exercise those demons of, you know, the bad wars. And yet... Again, you know, it's they're pretending, you know, in, in Afghanistan, right? If we leave Afghanistan, the Taliban is almost certainly going to take over large areas. People f- pretend that that's not going to be a problem, but it is. And, um, you know, of course, the Taliban and al-Qaeda maintain that close relationship, as we discussed. I don't want to get into the, all that here. But, you know, it's just the perfect example of closing our eyes and pretending that something is, you know, something that uh, we hope to happen um, you know, it's, it's just not going to happen. I mean, Afghanistan is not going to be all, you know, it's not going peaceful just because we want it to. And just because we're going to withdraw, things are going to get worse. And as you said, you know, keeping a small footprint can at least keep a lid on some of these problems, but that is not the desire of the, of the, 
U.S. political leadership, not desire of the American public. So, you know, it's we're going to have to leave and there's going to be there's going to be problems for it. We need to be wide awake as to what those problems will be. So, all right. So we've got we've got the Zawahiri message that came out on the anniversary of 9-11, even though it wasn't 9-11 themed at all. It was he was all, his, you know, all all angry about the Al Jazeera production and, and accusations that Al Qaeda is in the pocket of various governments. The second thing that Al Qaeda released time for the 9-11 anniversary, and this was not, had a 9-11 theme, was an English translation of One Uma, their, one of their magazines. This is the third issue, third edition of it. This this issue of One Uma um, did, in fact, include a lot of 9-11 themed material, a lot of 9-11 themed uh, discussion, history, Bin Laden's role, that sort of thing. But it sort of looked like just recirculating old content. It wasn't new content. It was something they just put out in English translation, something they already released late last year in Arabic. Um, so again, it's curious that they, didn't, they couldn't come up with anything new for the 9-11 anniversary. Yeah, I, I can't explain this. I mean, it should just be easy to do, and yet they just seem to mail it in this year. Maybe they're saving it for the 20th anniversary, Tom. Who knows? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of speculation, of course, about Zawahiri's fate and what he's doing right now. Um, you know, I'm sure that COVID has caused problems for Al-Qaeda. It's caused problems for everybody. So how could it not cause problems for Al-Qaeda? Uh, I, I would imagine that an elderly leader like Zawahiri and probably some of the other elderly leaders around him have wanted to try and avoid uh, being infected. Maybe that some of them have been infected. Who knows? You know, we don't really know. There's a lot of murky sort of uncertainty here regarding all this. Um, but what's curious about it, and Zawahiri, of course, he has been relatively quiet of late. You know, there was a period from mid-2015 after Mu- after the Taliban uh, admitted that Muammar Omar had been dead for about two years. Uh, Zawahiri started producing material regularly um, in, I think it was August 2015, and he basically on and off, but for the most part, has, has produced pretty regular content until this year, I would say. Maybe there have been interruptions for sure, but he's produced, a, he's produced a lot of content, a lot more content than Abu Baker al-Baghdadi ever did. Um, and so that you know that's, that's an interesting point in all this is that he's, he has been quiet of late, and that's fueling speculation about his fate. There's been rumors he has health problems, heart problems, you know, this and that. Who knows? We don't know. And a lot of people spreading this stuff probably don't know either. Uh, but... Um, one last point about his message um, that he released time for 9-11. He takes a swipe at Abu Baker al-Baghdadi, who I just mentioned. He goes after him. I meant to mention this earlier. And what's interesting is um, he discusses the general guidelines for jihad, which were put out in 2013. And here's – this is – the reason why I'm going to bring this up now because it's a good segue to our next segment on this. And what, what has been Zawahiri's role all along? You know, how, how much of a role has he played in the actual global al-Qaeda network? Well, here's, a, here's an example, which I think is backed up by other evidence. So he says in this message that was released just now, uh, just on the anniversary of 9-11, that Al-Qaeda circulated its general guidelines of jihad to the various Al-Qaeda branches for comment. So this was their sort of their document setting forth how Al-Qaeda viewed waging jihad and what were appropriate targets and how, how to go about waging, how to go about fighting and that sort of thing. Not myopically focused on the U.S. Yes, the U.S. would be the principal enemy that they want to hit, but if you read the document, you realize that they've declared jihad on all sorts of entities. Yes, they want to neutralize some of them, but, you know, there's all sorts of cases from Syria to, you know, Somalia where they're in, in Afghanistan and Mali. There's all sorts of places where jihad is totally acceptable to al-Qaeda, even if they're not hitting the U.S. on a day-to-day basis, and, and most cases are not. So they have a, a very expansive definition of what they mean by global jihad, which is often, I think, misunderstood. But um, he says, look, we circulate this general guidelines for jihad to all the al-Qaeda branches, including the Islamic State of Iraq, including uh, Baghdadi and his crew. And um, basically, we solicited comments. Baghdadi and his crew didn't comment on it. They didn't offer any objections. It wasn't until we officially disavowed Baghdadi and, and his group that they started raising problems with it and, and decrying its methodology, the manhaj, and saying that basically there are problems with it and, and sort of criticizing us and all this stuff. stuff. Two points, uh, criticizing the document. Two points about that. One, this is an example of how Al-Qaeda senior leadership has, in fact, maintained a cohesive network with the so-called regional branches, right? And two, um, what are the regional branches? Well, you have these, you know, they're often called affiliates, right? These regional branches. But they are, this goes back to our defining Al-Qaeda, which is often misunderstood again. Um, Al-Qaeda has these regional branches that are, built to wage jihad, wage insurgencies in various theaters to try and topple the existing political structures, existing governments, and replace them with 
regimes devoted to their version of governing by Sharia or Islamic law. And so you, today you have AQAM, AQAP, um, you have um, Shabab in Somalia, you have Al Qaeda in the Indian subcontinent, you have a murky situation in Syria where it was Nusra Front, and then there's a whole convoluted story there. We're not going to revisit all that right now. But you have these regional branches of Al Qaeda that um, you know are organized for waging jihad. And there's been a common assumption that basically AQSL or AQ senior leadership isn't really all that involved with these branches, even though they maintain loyalty to the Amir, overall Amir of Al-Qaeda. And yet here's one example, and we have many to more to choose from. Here's one example of where Zawahiri is saying, and we think this is right based on other evidence, that basically they were circulating these general guidelines of jihad in 2013 to make sure that everybody was on board with the message. Right, Bill? Yeah, exactly. And not only that, they were waiting for a response and they had, you know, were waiting to discuss the, you know, answer any questions that, that arose from the guidelines. And one of the big complaints he had, of course, with Baghdadi is that he never did receive a response. He just, you know, kept driving, driving on um, and being divisive. And that's ultimately what led to the split. But yeah. So that brings us to the second part of this week's episode of the podcast. Um, in the Washington Post on September 10th, there was this op-ed by Christopher Miller, who's the new director of the National Counterterrorism Center and the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. It's a very long title. Um, and essentially in this op-ed, Miller is arguing that Al-Qaeda is on the verge of defeat. Um, he, the op-ed title is, This 9-11 Anniversary Arrives with the End of the War on Al-Qaeda Well in Sight. And the first thing that comes to mind, Bill, when we read this op-ed and see the title and then read through it, is that we've been here before. We've heard this before. We heard this during the Obama administration, of course. It was John Brennan, who was a senior counterterrorism advisor to President Obama, tried to declare al-Qaeda on the verge of defeat um, sometime in 2011, 2012. Um, Brennan at the time argued that um, basically he could see the end of the war against al-Qaeda taking place sometime in the next decade. We argued against Brennan's um, sort of worldview or, or sort of what he was saying at the time. Uh, we argued against other people in Washington at the time about it. He was wrong for a lot of reasons, uh, many of which we we sort of said at the time why he was going to be wrong and, and turned out he was wrong. I mean, unfortunately, we wish Brennan were right about that. We wish Miller were right about this, but we just don't find the specific arguments to be convincing, right? Um, so, Bill, we, we've, we've, it seems like we've been there before, right? We've done this before. We've talked about this before. It seems it's sort of deja vu. It sure is, Tom. I mean, you know, we've been touting the defeat of Al Qaeda for the last decade, not you and I, obviously, but the right. intelligence officials, administration officials across um, two administrations now, actually three. I mean, even the Bush administration early on in this war was saying things like, you know, they killed 75 percent of Al Qaeda's top leadership and, you know, we could see the end is near. So the. You know, th this is what makes this argument very unconvincing, to, part of what makes it very unconvincing to me. They're making the same arguments over and over to tell us why Al-Qaeda is defeated, and yet it isn't. Um, and Al-Qaeda, you know, its footprint has expanded across the globe rather than retracted. So, you know, we go back, look at September 10th, 2001, and then look at today. You know, it's September 10th, Al-Qaeda's prime insurgency was in Afghanistan. It really was operating on a very cellular level, very small level, level in several other countries. But today, as Al-Qaeda has branches in Saudi Arabia, in, or I'm sorry, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, Al-Qaeda in, in the Islamic Maghreb, um, al um, Shabab in Shabab Somalia. In Somalia. Yeah, yeah, I'm just saying. Yeah. I mean, that, that, Islamic... that goes to the point here with this remnants idea. So the remnants right. idea, I mean... It, what do you mean by remnants? It's sort of a, an empty word, really. It doesn't it's it's a buzzword we've heard repeated over and over again in the context of ISIS and Al Qaeda. We've heard various different combatant commands use it. Different officials have used it. It's sort of one of these words that people use without really thinking about it, uh, about what it means, in my view. Um, and when you say remnants, you know, you know, having an insurgency or multiple insurgencies that are loyal to Al Qaeda senior leadership that have territory or are fighting for territory in all these countries. Um, those, those aren't remnants, right? Those are branches of an international organization. Um, so, yeah. you, know, you know, how is Shabab, you know, which is openly loyal to Ayman al-Zawahiri and was, and was loyal to Osama bin Laden. There's a whole story there about how bin Laden told them to keep their baya on the down low, but we're going to get into that in a future episode. But you have al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, which is openly loyal to Ayman al-Zawahiri and was openly loyal to bin Laden. You have al-Qaeda in the Indian subcontinent, stood up in 2014 to wage insurgencies. Wage insurgency in Afghanistan also export terror throughout Pakistan and Kashmir and elsewhere. 
uh, Bangladesh, Burma, perhaps, although the Burma story never really got off the ground as far as we can tell. Um, then you have Syria, where you have a convoluted chain of command for sure, but you have multiple Al-Qaeda actors there. And in Yemen, you have a, a QAP, Al-Qaeda Iranian Peninsula. You, you look at that story, that's not remnants, right? I mean, those are those are several organizations that are actually part of one organization, which is Al-Qaeda, but there's sort of this disconnect the dots mindset on all this that sort of looks at all that as something distinct from the original Al-Qaeda so-called core. Uh, and we've debunked that many times. There is no sort of distinction there, really. I mean, you have Al-Qaeda core figures in each one of these branches, really. Uh, you can you can point to, the, point to them as veterans that go back a long way. So really, our objections to this op-ed from a factual basis and a logical basis starts right from the very first word, remnants, right? What does that even mean? What does remnants even yeah, really it, mean? Exactly, Tom. I mean, look, you know, and again, Al-Qaeda on, you know, September 10th, 2001, probably several thousand fighters in its ranks in Afghanistan. Yeah, and some, people say if, some people say a few hundred. I don't find that convincing, right? No. The no, no, Commission report said that. Between you know up between ten and twenty thousand fighters went through Al Qaeda sponsored camps between nineteen ninety six and September two thousand and one. You know, there's a whole argument over Baya and who's loyal to Al Qaeda, who's really a member and who isn't. I don't want to get into all that. So sort right. of tor- torturous conversation. But I- the bottom line is they ceded the sort of the they ceded the ground for their jihadi revolution back before nine eleven, and they've borne the fruits of that after nine eleven in some ways, and they've seen, suffered many setbacks for sure. But you could point to guys who started in the nineteen nineties who are still going. Right, Bill? Yeah, right. Exactly. And so now throughout Al-Qaeda's branches, you have several thousand at least in each of them. So, you know, how is this? That That's not what remnants look like. And, you know, if you want to make the argument and, that— And well, by the Al-Qaeda's, way, the number of fighters saying— the number of fighters thing we don't really actually know, right? We, but we don't. Wanna, yeah, right. we don't. Really, but you but, know, yeah. listen, I I think yeah. you could make some logical deductions if Shabab yeah. controls twenty five percent of Somalia. Totally. Yeah. You you have yeah. to figure it. It doesn't have just one or two hundred fighters doing right. this. Right. You need to have. You know, there's just some basic logic on what the absolute minimum of what what Al Qaeda. You know what Al Qaeda has in each branch. Uh, so. Right. Regardless, I mean, it's not in numbers. That doesn't, that's not just it. But, you know, and if you want to discount Al Qaeda's insurgency as well, that's not part of Al Qaeda, then you don't understand what Al Qaeda is. The insurgencies are the lifeblood of Al Qaeda. It, it seeks to establish a global caliphate. It's going to do this by forming emirates. And then, you know, look, attacks on the, not, look at the 9 11 report. It used the camps, it used the insurgency to, to recruit the attackers for 9 11. That's been true. Um, in terrorist attacks, yeah. Even, in since, Afghanistan, I would say it wasn't even an insurgency in Afghanistan at the time, though. It was actually supporting the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan, yeah, right? And then, and then it reorganized and has been supporting Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan ever since. And now it's it's been an insurgency for many years, for two, for nearly you know twenty years now almost. Um, it's been an insurgency, you know, helping to resurrect the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan. Um, but you know, so you look at that, yeah. I mean, a very small percentage of the guys that went through Al Qaeda camps were actually tasked with something like nine eleven. Very small percentage overall. And yet this fundamental lesson seems like people still haven't learned it, you know, that basically, you know, this was a fundamentally an insurgency, a, a, a organization that was deli- dedicated to waging jihad as revolutionaries, political revolutionaries, that they wanted to overthrow the existing world order or, or the existing governance structures in various Muslim majority countries and impose their sort of version of Sharia or Islamic law. Um, that story is still not really well understood. And that gets to the whole point of remnants. It's not remnants if they're fighting for ground in all these countries, right, Bill? Yeah, and controlling ground in, in many of yep. these countries, too. Yeah. Either overtly or covertly. Like, we it's know like AQAP a, controls some remote areas in, in, in southern sure. Yemen. Sure, they um, do, yeah. It, it, and they, and they just not we, you, and I, you and I know, we predicted it, right, when they AQAP twice has taken over much of southern Yemen. They melted away when that Arab-led coalition, yeah. the UAE and Saudi Arabia, went in and tried to clear them out. They didn't really clear them out. There wasn't heavy fighting. They just sort of melted away and lived to fight another day. They have their own problems. AQAP has its own problems. All these organizations, all these branches of al-Qaeda, al-Qaeda itself, they have multiple problems. We're not whitewashing that or saying they don't. They do. But the point is, these aren't remnants, right? If you have, you right. know, by any by any stretch of the imagination, you look at this and you say, if you're Osama bin Laden on September 10th, 2001, you say, hey, you know, I'd like to have full-blown insurgency organizations in Yemen, Somalia, West Africa, covert presence in Libya, insurgency organizations in Syria, reorganized assets in Afghanistan and Pakistan that actually survived the American-led war. He's probably going to take that, you know, yep. even with the yeah, setbacks, that, you know, even with the setbacks that ISIS, you know, gave him along the way, you know. Yeah, but um, we have to remember they're not operating on our timeline of four years, you know, in election cycles. They're they're they recognize and they'll tell they'll say this. They say it in their propaganda all the time that their their timeline, you know, they recognize that they're fighting a dare I say long war 
and that they have to be committed to it. That's they they know that they're not going to have victory tomorrow or victory next week or even next year. But, you know, if you if you look at the timeline, as you said, Tom, from September 11th, 2010, I'm sorry, September 11th, yeah, 2001 to today, they have to be, you know, despite the setbacks and the death of key leaders and, and you know, whatever pro- the split, like you said, the split with the Islamic State, other problems that the organization has on the whole, it's expanded. It hasn't retracted. And that is not what a remnant looks like. And then, so this brings us to the second sentence of the op-ed, of Miller's op-ed, which is, but it is now possible to see the contours of how the war against Al-Qaeda ends. Now, I read through the op-ed very carefully, and I didn't see him explain how, what the, those contours are. You know, if you're going to make the claim that you can see how this is going to end, well, then you got to explain it. You know, if if you see that there's a, there is a moment here where this is actually going to be over, you have to explain why why that is, why you see that. And in fact, you see some hedging later on in the op-ed. He sort of warns against the pre- de- premature de- declaration of victory in Iraq and the rise of ISIS and the mission accomplished moment and sort of the setbacks we've seen in the past, you know, sort of hedging his bets a little bit. And I and I don't actually see the explanation of how this actually ends in this. You know, I don't see that at all. Do you, Bill? I don't see the contours here at all. No, it, it's not laid out through the piece. And it's another reason why this is very unconvincing. The rest is just a sell job, um, in my opinion, to just claim that Al-Qaeda is on the verge of defeat. But we get no information whatsoever on why he believes this. And, and you know, look, if you want to write an op-ed of this um, nature, you better provide some information to explain why you think so. And so the, the second paragraph in the op-ed is the United States had three aims in this war. This is Miller writing now. Strengthen the country's border defenses, pursue our enemies, and facilitate our allies' ability to lead the counterterrorism to fight. We have succeeded in making it extremely difficult for terrorists to enter the United States to conduct cataclysmic attacks, and we have bolstered our allies' capabilities. Well, there are a lot of problems with that. I think we're going to give him a pass on the defensive part. We both think that our defenses have improved in a lot of ways. Um, sure, uh, you know, a lot of plots have been stopped. You know, a lot of uh, efforts by Al Qaeda to attack us again uh, have been thwarted. You know, that that's obviously a success story that counterterrorism officials deserve credit for. Um, but you know, this idea that basically, you know. That essentially mission it's sort of he's getting close to saying mission accomplished we've done we've done what we needed to do to keep the terrorist threat at bay the problem with this is when i look at this is you know first of all strengthening our country's border defenses well we know that actually the 9-11 plot itself they're kind of lucky on that you know remember muhammad al-qatani was gonna be the 20th hijacker he was put he was turned away by an immigration official um you know, that Zacharias Masali, who was involved in 9-11 or a follow-on plot, was detected beforehand. You had the two, um, Khalid al-Madar and Nawaf al-Hazmi, who should have been detected uh, or were detected by the CIA. And then and sort of there was some bungling there inside the U.S. government about, you know, passing information on the FBI. They became hijackers. There were multiple tripwires, in other words, that al-Qaeda set off prior to 9-11. It just, the, the U.S. government just didn't put it all together to stop it. And what I'm, what I'm saying is it's sort of a low bar, right, to say, well, we've improved our defenses in that regard. You know, it's not a really a high bar that you have to pass. I mean, yeah, you've made it diff- more difficult for terrorists to get in the country. Good. Uh, but that's not really a high bar, or high threshold, I think. Do you, Bill? Yeah, no, I don't. I mean, I think at the very least you should be able to do this. This is one that you – and again, I'm getting all credit to them – to counterterrorism officials, Homeland Security, U.S. military for making this happen. Um, it, it, I think it's on the whole, it has been very effective. But, you know, as you noted, it, it is a low bar. I mean, this is one that we should have the ability to have the, the greatest handle on. So yeah. uh, but but I will concede that point. I mean, that, that it's it's fair. Um, and so we're going to get to the pursue our enemies part of that for that sentence we just read. But here's let's talk about another part of this. It's just uh, he writes facilitate our allies' ability to lead the counterterrorism fight. Well, you know, let's start in Afghanistan, where the Afghan government is in trouble. It's besieged by the Taliban. We've critiqued the Taliban U.S. deal at length in previous episodes and in writing. You know, we don't buy it for a second. We don't think the Taliban is going to lay down its arms and join some power sharing agreement with the Afghan government. There's no hint of that. They're fighting for the Islamic Emirate. And there's also no reason to believe at this point that they've broken with Al Qaeda, um, despite the assurances we've been given. Um, And the U.S. is looking to get out. Uh, So that's the original ally in this fight is the Afghan government. And if the U.S. does leave uh, by April 2021, which is the which is the premise of the deal with the Taliban and what the Trump administration has pushed for, um, 
that ally is going to be in trouble and not going to be able to actually continue and, and, and very quickly could see ground to the jihadis once again and could lead to a victory for Al Qaeda and its allies in the Taliban. Um, so, you know, there are other areas like in Somalia where the federal government is struggling. Uh, Mali, there's just a coup in Mali, which we discussed, uh, which is leading the fight. Um, you know, there's a, a will to get desire to get out of Syria where 2,000 U.S. special forces were standing up uh, 60,000 Kurdish fighters, and many of which are aligned with the PKK. We won't get into that story again. Uh, but, you know, that, that was our ally there. There's no government to ally with in Syria. Uh, because the Assad regime is monstrous. And then there's all sorts of problems in Iraq where we, the, the Trump administration is still committed to a small presence there. But this is a sort of a dubious story, in other words, that we've stood up our allies' ability to fight. And it's something which if there's – if you're not – if if al-Qaeda truly isn't on the verge of defeat, if this is a long-term game and the U.S. cuts and runs from this, from this sort of you know model that we've backed into, the U.S. has backed into – then this point actually becomes the exact opposite. The U.S. hasn't stood up enough allies to fight, maybe because they couldn't. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, Tom. I mean, you know, and I'll add to the to the mix Yemen. I mean, you know, you have a Yemeni yeah, I government. I knew when I was sticking it off. I forgot Yemen, but good. I, thing. Tom, I, I, you, 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 picked, you picked it up. Go for it. So, yeah. The problem with this is, and I think this really speaks to, to the – we can do this all day. I mean, we can go through other countries as well. I mean, aside from countries like I think you could say the Philippines and Indonesia where they've gotten some kind of handle on this, I can't really think of – and, and – as well, they should. These are not failed states. Um, and here's the I other country we forgot, Bill: Pakistan. Yeah, pa- you know? right. Ex- Which and I we mean, went through the duplicity of Pakistan. You know, never solved that. That's supposedly a key ally in all this, and we know that whole yeah. story. You know, there. You know, so I mean, yeah, this and, point and sort of seems to me this to be really pretty speaks weak, to, right? to yeah, exactly. This speaks that we can do this all day, and this really explains. Nobody thinks that any any of these. Got, remember the the. Um, Obama administration officials were set, were touting the Yemen model just before the Yemeni um, President Obama himself touted yeah. the Yemen model, and, and yeah, there's right. no account, no accountability for this at all. That that yeah. that was totally wrong, you know. Yeah, the totally Yemen wrong, model, no accountability, and, you know? and just for anyone who who may forget, that was, hey, look, we're backing a government. It's fighting Al Qaeda on its own. We only have like 200 special forces and intelligence in there. We have a minimal footprint. Success against the Al- AQAP um, because we killed some leaders, and then all of a sudden, the Yemeni Oops. civil war begins with the the fight with the Houthis, and then you have the separatists, and you know. Then you have this, you know, this basically a Game of Thrones situation with multi actors, where the 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 actor that we back inside Yemen only controls perhaps a quarter of the country. Um, it's it lost the capital of, of Sanaa to the Houthis, and the Houthis, I would argue, are probably in a better position today than they were five years ago when this started. So. You know, this is where I I look at this and I say, you know, look, nobody believes this. Nobody believes that any of our allies that we stood up or attempted to stand up, if we withdrew tomorrow, I would argue that probably several of these countries within six months would collapse. Yeah, I mean, our our forecast is if the U.S. were to withdraw from all these areas, we definitely would see, you know, a couple, at least a couple emirates rise, I think, right? Yeah. That's, where that's where we're forecasting. Yeah, easily uh, in Somalia, I think, uh, Yem- I think in Yemen, Afghanistan. You know, Yemen, the, Yemen, the, the only thing about Yemen is the Houthis do yes. act like a, a balancing act there. So even even you could argue absent American intervention, you know, there is sort of some countervailing force. You know, same thing with Al Qaeda's presence in Idlib and in Syria. There's multiple problems there. Of course, we've talked about that. But the Assad regime in Russia and Iran act like a counterbalancing force there to a certain to a certain degree. I don't want to use the word balancing too much because yeah. that gets into this sort of realist sort of um, construct, which I don't buy. Um, but you know, but the bottom line is there are other forces that are sort of keeping them at bay or or countering them. Um, but there are places where if the U.S. leaves the fight. It's very difficult to see how the local allies are going to be able to withstand the sort of the ongoing jihad. Exactly. All right. So let's get to the next paragraph. Um, And this is a this is a problematic paragraph in particular when it comes to specifics. So this is Christopher Miller. Again, this is the new director of the National Counterterrorism Center. He writes, as for pursuing our enemies, the campaign to defeat Al Qaeda began immediately after 9-11 when committed Americans and like minded partners sallied forth to destroy the terrorist havens in Afghanistan and to wreck their command and control capabilities. The very next sentence he writes, Al-Qaeda can still direct others to commit acts of violence as seen by the heinous killing of three Americans in Florida at Naval Air Station Pensacola last year, but is no longer capable of conducting large-scale attacks. 
Well, there's a lot baked into there, but let's start with this whole idea that the U.S. went in, destroyed the terrorist safe havens in Afghanistan immediately after 9-11 and wrecked al-Qaeda's command and control capabilities because um, this is this is the problem, right? Um, so when you look at, so Miller, I th- again, I think he started his job in mid-August. You can look, there's an inspector general's report that's dated August 14th. It came out on August 18th from the Defense Department's inspector general's office. Which notes, again, and we've gone through this many, many times, Al-Qaeda continues to fight alongside the Taliban in Afghanistan against the Afghan government. Um, the re, you know, reformed Al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda and the Indian subcontinent and other Al-Qaeda actors you know, are continuing to fight alongside the Taliban. So even after this many years, um, the U.S. hasn't actually destroyed Al-Qaeda's safe havens in Afghanistan, has it? Because Al-Qaeda is still there fighting alongside the Taliban. They, so even if you're going to talk about Al-Qaeda being on the verge of defeat... We talked about all these other theaters. Well, they're not even really on the verge of defeat as far as we could tell in Afghanistan after all this time. Uh, and so that's a problem, right, Bill? I mean, let's start with there and then we're going to get to yeah. the command and control stuff. But what, what would you say about that, about the safe havens point? Yeah, no, look, this you know, we've seen al-Qaeda camps inside Afghanistan, for instance. Um yeah, it, the, we know that Al Qaeda has a presence in northwestern Pakistan, and again, this isn't just well, and the cities of Pakistan as well. Which of exactly, Pakistan, exactly. Pakistani's problem, not ours, but yeah, right. Yeah. And you know, and again, this isn't just now their their capabilities, their their camps, their um, they're not just based in Afghanistan. It's it's throughout. It's in Africa. It's in you know the Middle East. It's in so. But yeah, the point was, is, the point is here is that they didn't. We didn't. I mean, if you're going to argue Al Qaeda's on the verge of defeat. This started with Afghanistan. Yeah. And the story isn't finished there. You know, the yeah. U.S. is looking to withdraw, is looking to absolve the Taliban of its decades long relationship and alliance with Al Qaeda. Al Qaeda is still there, according to all the official sources and all the evidence we see. There's no evidence that they're gone. You see, sometimes people say, oh, you know, if, that the Taliban, you know, may let them back in after America leaves. No, no, they've been there the whole time, folks, right? They're, yeah. they're still there. We've done, this, the Long War Journal exists to document this, you know, that they've been there the whole time. So, it's, it's tough to say that they're on the verge of defeat or you can see the contours of how this ends when you can't even tell me how it ends in Afghanistan, right. uh, which is the first first part of it, right? Yep. But then let's let's get to the other part of this, which is he says that, uh, you know, basically he talks about Americans and their partners going to Afghanistan to wreck their command and control capabilities. Now, as longtime readers of the Long War Journal and uh, people who followed our writings and listened to us for years know, we fought to get the Osama bin Laden files released. We're going to have more on that in the upcoming episodes, of course. We're sort of behind on that for various reasons, technical difficulties in the past week and some other issues. Um, but we're, we got more coming on that. But um, the thing that Bin Laden files show and other pieces of evidence show is that the U.S. didn't wreck al-Qaeda's command and control capabilities. That's the point. Um, <clears throat> you don't have to just listen to us. You can listen to or read Mike Morell's book. He's a former acting director of the CIA. He wrote a book called The Great War. And he talks about how the CIA, prior to the Bin Laden raid in May of 2011, thought that Bin Laden was just a spiritual figurehead. He was out of the game, um, that he had given up management of day-to-day, uh, day-to-day management uh, cap- uh, sort of operational capabilities to Ayman al-Zawahiri, his then number two. They get this archive, this vast trove of intelligence in Bin Laden's compound, and shows that's not true, that Bin Laden is, in fact, still very much managing affairs globally. And we we could demonstrate that in a lot of ways. We're not going to get off into a whole tangent here right now on that. Uh, but the point is that we can muster a lot of evidence to support that. And that was 2011. Um, so they hadn't wrecked Al-Qaeda's command and control capabilities by then. Um, obviously, there's there are interruptions in Al-Qaeda's command and control capabilities. We, we think that's right. But there are good reasons to think that it continues to have, the Al-Qaeda leadership continues to have a degree, perhaps in some cases, a large degree of command and control. Um, you know, we saw in the Bin Laden files that Zawahiri was already in control of Al Qaeda and Islamic Maghreb. Bin Laden said every time, you know, you he's talking to his lieutenant at the time in in uh, West Africa, Abdul Malik Drabdel, who's since been killed in June of this year. And there's correspondence back and forth saying every time you write to me, make sure you copy the good doctor. I'm an Al Zawahiri because he's in charge of the Maghreb. And you can see that 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 Zawahiri has played a role in this global expansion all along. He's the one who oftentimes you know, is negotiating and recognizing these official branches, these regional branches of Al Qaeda that we saw pop up. Zaw- Bin Laden totally blessed that, contrary to what some claim, by the way. Um, but you can see that Zawahiri you know, is very, very active in managing these regional branches of Al Qaeda all along. We've got other evidence like that. A couple of years ago, we had a statement from, remember, Bill, remember this? I think it was Abdul al Shami, his name was. He's sort of a media operative for Al Qaeda that popped up out of nowhere 
And he, there was sort of during the disagreements over what was going on in Syria, he, pump, he publishes a statement for, <laughs> on behalf of Asahab saying, what are you guys talking about? You have these communication problems. We got this whole back end. You're, you can communicate with us all the time. Remember, we set this all up. You know, so you've got stuff like that. You've got now, I'll give you one more point, right? And this, I'll tee up on this one, Bill. September of last year, Asim Umar, right? What do we find out during this raid in Helmand, southern Afghanistan, when Asim Umar is killed in a joint Afghan-U.S. raid? Who else is killed in that raid alongside Asim Umar, Bill? Yeah, it's the, it, it's a perfect example. They killed, um, Asim Umar had a courier who had directly reported to Ayman al-Zawahiri. So, you know, look, Asim Umar has been described as the head of al-Qaeda in the Indian subcontinent. Um, we think he had a much greater role within al-Qaeda because of that. Look, you just don't get a uh, your own courier to Ayman al-Zawahiri. Well, not even just because of that, because we know Osama Mahmoud, his lieutenant, yes. started becoming a spokesperson. Right. He was a spokesman for AQS, but he sort of appears to have been really the yeah, mirror to promote of AQS. It to the yeah. Mirror. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, sure. I, mean, I was making the point that he's uh, plays a, a far more senior role well, you can, than just could, a senior. Yeah, because you could have other regional rights. branch, regional emirs who have their own couriers just out here. Yeah, it's possible, uh, you know. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, and, and it just shows that there is this command and control that that continues to this day. Look, if he had said disrupt immediately, disrupted Al Qaeda's command and control after nine eleven, I'd be like, okay, this is a decent argument. Al Qaeda did have to scatter from Afghanistan, but the problem is, is it quickly reestablished its command and control networks and and then began backing the Taliban and then was able to support the insurgency in Iraq and and form form um you know its own insurgency within within Iraq so that and and communicate back and forth and send operatives and key leaders to help direct the Iraqi insurgency um or al qaeda in um al qaeda to direct al qaeda in Iraq of course um yeah so so for these reasons it's just you cannot in any way say that the command and control was disrupt or was just destroyed. It was merely disrupted for a short period of time. Yeah, there's probably there's probably been multiple disruptions. I don't want to, you know, obviously, you know, sure. different couriers are arrested, killed, that sort of thing. Yeah, sure. I mean, there's all sorts of disruptions. But the point is, you have to you have to offer us a real assessment of command and control and say that it's 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 been firmly ended and it hasn't. And in fact, the very next sentence in his op ed, this is Miller's op ed in the Washington Post. He writes, Al Qaeda can still direct others to commit acts of violence as seen by the heinous killing of three Americans in Florida at Naval Air Station Pensacola last year, but it is no longer capable of conducting large-scale attacks. Well, now, wait a minute. The first part of that sentence shows you that there is a command and control infrastructure right. still in place, right? I mean, um, you can still direct others to commit violence, including this, you know, the Mohammed al-Shamrani, the Saudi second lieutenant who was at this U.S. military base in Pensacola. He was in regular contact, we know from the FBI, we know that he was in regular contact with an AQAP operative or operatives, um, his handlers, operations guys who were giving him advice and walking through this. Um, so they they clearly played a large role in directing that attack. I mean, you can use plenty of evidence that there's certain disconnected daughters who want to say otherwise, but I think the evidence the FBI has produced is enough to show, and AQAP has produced some evidence to show that, that in fact, they had this ongoing relationship with this guy, Shamrani. Um, now that begs the question, you know, Shimrani went for this targeted killing at Naval Air Station Pensacola. He could have done something that was had more casualties, right? He could have done something that had that killed more people. Um, it shows that even despite all the difficulties we talked about in terms of stopping people from getting in the U.S., um, which we agree that 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 the U.S. has done a lot in, long, in in that regard. Here's an example where it goes the other way, where they didn't stop him. You know, they actually got a sleeper agent onto a U.S. military base, which is, should even be should be even more security involved there than just a civilian sort of coming into a civilian population. And yet they Al Qaeda was able to get a guy in there or a guy who was working with Al Qaeda got in there. Um and then so, you know, and then he says they're no longer capable of committing large scale attacks. That's you know, look, maybe, maybe not, right? We don't really know. I mean, this goes to the point which is what's Al Qaeda's external operations capability? And a couple points here, Bill, and I want you to weigh in on this. First thing as you laid out with the insurgencies, attacking the West isn't their only goal. They're not myopically yeah, exactly. obsessed with these spectacular terrorist attacks, right? They're doing all this yeah, other this stuff. This is actually my biggest right? problem with this entire paragraph, that it completely neglects what al-Qaeda is, is about. Yeah, go ahead, Tom. They're committing large-scale attacks elsewhere, right? Not inside the U.S., but they're doing it elsewhere. I mean, you know, in Somalia, Shabab, which is part of al-Qaeda, al-Qaeda is on Maghreb. Al-Qaeda in the Indian subcontinent is helping the Taliban fight. You know, there's evidence that they're involved in these operations in cities and in Afghanistan and are leading the fight. In fact, we got a, a special episode coming on this in the future here, leading the fight for the Taliban or helping to lead the fight for the Taliban in Eastern Afghanistan against ISIS. Those are pretty big attacks. They're not against the U.S. or CONUS, but they're, you know, you can look at some of Al-Qaeda's literature. They're threatening America while doing that even. Um, so they're, they're actually committing, 
their operational activity is still very high, even if they're not committing something that catches the headlines like 9-11, right? They're not, they're not killing 3,000 Americans in a day, but they're still committing an awful lot of violence every day. One of the things I said recently is, you know, Al-Qaeda kills people every day. When you properly define Al-Qaeda, you realize Al-Qaeda is killing people every single day. You know, it's just that not, they're not doing something like 9-11, which makes everybody think about Al-Qaeda. They're doing it a different way. Um, and then, you know, speak, Bill, a little bit about the external operations capability. You, you covered for years with this drone campaign going after Al-Qaeda types. You know, basically the implication here, the real implication here, and it's not spelled out, but the implication is that their external operations capability, we just show that their insurgency capability, the war fighting elsewhere, that's not been eliminated. Far from it. But basically the implication here is that their external operations capability, putting aside Pensacola, which cuts against this. Uh, the implication is that their external operations capability has been so limited that they're not able to do it, another big attack. What do you think about that, Bill? Yeah, I, 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 again, I'd like to see some evidence of that, but I can't recall the last time a senior leader within Al-Qaeda's external operations network has been killed. And can we even name, Tom, the, the, yeah, who the, is he? Al, the head of Al-Qaeda's external operations or who's on its committee? We knew that information several years ago. Now we don't – we're not – I'm sure – Listen, somebody at NCTC probably knows that answer, uh, yeah. but it's not public, you know. Um, yeah. But the point is that you know who is he? What is he doing? You know, we know yeah. the KS, we know Khalid Sheikh Mohammed had a series of successors, and you covered the drone campaign better than anybody, Bill, of how we were targeting those guys. We haven't killed somebody like that in a while, no. right? It no, right? because look, Al Qaeda was. I say we, I mean, the U.S. hasn't killed. We obviously, I say we, I don't know why. That's a sort of rhetorical slip. I think we said that. Sure. the U.S. hasn't killed them in some time, you know. So. Sure. Well, we're Americans, Tom, so we, we tend to do it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, no, listen, Al -Qaeda, when we were conducting the drone campaign, but Al-Qaeda learned how to disperse its um, operations, its, its, uh, its key leaders across the globe. For instance, we knew that Nasser al-Wahashi, who was the head of Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, of course, we killed him several years ago. I believe it was 2015, right, Tom? 2015, 2016. Um, he, was, um, uh, he was also Al-Qaeda's gen general manager, which is a key position within the organization. Uh, you could argue he's the number th real number three within Al-Qaeda, although I think those, that type of terminology really doesn't make sense when you look at what Al-Qaeda is. Yeah, and they, actually, it turns out he went to be, be the, he was the deputy the Emir of Ayman al Zawahiri yes. at the time of his death, too. Right. So he was, exactly. he was technically number two. Basically, if Ayman al Zawahiri had been killed at the time, Nazar al Wahishi would have taken over global leadership of Al Qaeda. Yeah, exactly. And, and should we. Um, what do we know about Al Qaeda's external operations network? Is it just limited to its general command in Afghanistan, Pakistan? No, I don't think that's the truth. And and look, the the, the Pensacola attack was directed by AQAP. So, um, you know, and you, it's, have, you, have it's, cost, you have you have regular airstrikes, yeah. not regular, but but semi regular airstrikes in Syria against guys who the US military thinks are involved in the AQ's external operations yep. plotting against the West, including Europe. You yeah, have, that whole Coruscant group, remember that the yeah. targeting of that? Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. But even more recently, well. even more recently than that, though, you, sure. have, you have guys, you have guys, you have these uh, arrests in, in the last year or two of these guys who were in Shabab who were learning to take. They're apparently taking flight training lessons, which is sort of an ominous sort of warning. Um, you know, AQAM. You know, uh, they produce Yunus Al Maratani, who helped negotiate uh, the, basically the merger of AQAM's predecessor and Al -Qaeda, with Al Qaeda senior leadership. He went on to become the top guy in external operations for a time for, or one of the top guys in external operations for a time for Al Qaeda. Um, so you have this story where they've been doing this, and you have evidence from the Bin Laden's files, which we're going to talk about, where they were setting up an external operations capability in Turkey because it was an easy jumping off point for Europe. Um, you know, you, you have guys like Mohammed Islambouli, an Al Qaeda veteran, running around, uh, who you know, it sort of has that. As a, it's known in his dossier that he's been involved in sort of planning, sort of terrorist attacks. The best you have all sorts of evidence along these lines. So, yeah, I mean, look, they haven't pulled off another 9/11. Uh, I'm sure they've they've tried. They'd want to. Um, they've been stopped. Maybe that's because they've lost the capability to do something like that. I, but the point is, is that we're saying that hasn't been proven. Um, there are reasons why they don't make that their end all be all. It's not their sole reason for existence, as we've spelled out many times. And they could take a shot again sometime. Now, maybe they'll fail, maybe they'll succeed. But, uh, you know, the point is, I wouldn't just dismiss it outright, right? Yeah, exactly. Tom, th th I think that my, the, what bothered me the most, and there's a lot that bothered me about this paragraph, but, you know, look, it, it, I think this all completely neglects Al-Qaeda's true goals, which is the establishment of, of a global caliphate. If you think that Al-Qaeda is just about attacking the U.S. or attacking the West, um, 
then yeah, maybe you maybe you could sit back and, and crow and say, well, we, we could see the end of Al Qaeda. But the fact is, is that these insurgencies are the lifeblood for Al Qaeda and give it the capacity to conduct external attacks. And as long as these insurgencies are active, we should we have to be um, vigilant. Um, we have to be taking it to Al Qaeda. We have to be supporting local governments um, in their fight against Al Qaeda. And, and we're actually kind of seeing the opposite. We're seeing, we're, you know, we have, you know, the head of the National Counterterrorism Center all but declaring mission accomplished, and the Trump administration, which wants to withdraw from Iraq and Afghanistan and basically disengage from this war. Um, that is not a winning strategy. That that will not lead to the defeat of Al Qaeda. In fact, I would argue that you would see Al Qaeda grow even further than what we've explained. Yeah, I think the point too is that you know what's what's weird about this is I think America's backed into not even trying to defeat Al Qaeda. Um, it's just sort of containing disruption, as I recently wrote. And you know because you know a real defeat isn't around the corner anytime soon. But you know so Miller moves on. He, he touts his experience then as an active service uh, member with deployments in Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, he says that this experience has taught him about Al Qaeda, about strengths and weaknesses. Listen, I, I respect this guy's service for sure. I respect all the people who have served for America, and I, I get for people who don't want to deploy more Americans to these different theaters to fight Al Qaeda and affiliate groups anymore. I certainly can sympathize with that to a certain degree, or a large degree even. Um, you know, so that experience matters, and I respect that a, a great deal. But it doesn't mean you actually really do understand Al Qaeda's strengths and weaknesses, and this. Op-ed makes me think that he doesn't. I don't want to sound too dismissive or arrogant here, but um, you know, the, the next paragraph he writes, my assessment now is that Al-Qaeda is in crisis and the group's leadership has been severely diminished by U.S. attacks. And then this is what he says. This is what he writes. Its sole remaining ideological leader is Ayman al-Zawahiri, Osama bin Laden's deputy on 9-11, who lives in hiding, no doubt fully aware of his vulnerability. If he's lucky, he will die of natural causes. Otherwise, the long arm of the United States will inevitably find him and bring him to justice in one form or another. Now, you know, I, I really kind of um, uh, am taken back a little bit about the sort of the bravado here. Uh, you know, Ayman al-Zawahiri has survived this massive manhunt for about 20 years now by the U.S. Uh, he's somebody who was arrested in Egypt and detained in Egypt and let go. And then he's somebody who, um, you know, was, you know, obviously involved with Al-Qaeda very early on and Bin Laden very early on and helped plan the U.S. embassy bombings and his role in all that. Um, you know, He's somebody who's been wanted by the U.S. since the 1990s. He's somebody who's certainly been hunted by the U.S. since actively since 2001. He even turned a double agent against the CIA at one point. You remember that? Um, you know, you got to give this guy a little respect. I mean, you know, maybe, maybe the U.S. will get him tomorrow. I wouldn't be surprised if they did. But give him a little respect for surviving this long. This idea that you're going to crow about how you know he's going to the U.S. is going to get him. I mean, if if the U.S. did get him tomorrow, that'd be an awful long time it took to get him, right? I mean, this is not exactly a big success story in, in getting Ayman al Zawahiri, you know, 19 years after 9/11, right? I mean, come on, you know, and and nearly a decade after he assumed the number one role within Al Qaeda globally for Osama bin Laden. This is not exactly a big success story for the U.S. If, if that happened. And, of course, it hasn't happened. You know, he's still out there. He's still alive. So, Bill, why don't you talk about that for a second before we go to this phrase, sole remaining ideological leader, which is problematic, too. You know, it's something we've talked about over and over again, right? These guys exist for years. Bin Laden lasted almost 10 years before we got him, you know? Yeah, it, I, I really think he should have left this out. I mean, he, you know, if he does die of of natural causes. I mean, that that should be very embarrassing for the United States. This is like you noted, he's the most hunted man, probably one of the most hunted men on the planet. And yet he's not only, you know, survived, not only, you know, but he's he's thrived. He's directed Al Qaeda's branches, um, has mean you know again not perfect as you note these are not he's not a superman but he's maintained cohesion with al qaeda especially with the split between with the islamic state i think that was inevitable um so yeah you know i i don't understand what i would say is he survived the split with, you know there's some people it's there's some there's some people would say well you know the split with the islamic state is his fault is poor management i mean maybe but i think it's also there were other problems there that pre-existed all that and the point is yeah. that al-qaeda survived the split with the islamic state you know exactly uh, and that's wasn't, the islamic state's rise wasn't the death knell for al-qaeda either you know as some people right. predicted you know? right i mean even if he even if he was responsible for the split with the islamic state he was able to 
reorganize and get it together. But that's a discussion for another day. It, there, it, it, this is just this is not the the issue that I w- or not the point that I would make if I were him. I you know how long is the long arm of the United States if if I'm in Al Zawahiri could survive for 19 years and 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 possibly die of old at the age. It, this is just this is a complete embarrassment. It is something again that he should not be touting. And so then he, he also writes, so th- this is the way he introduces Zawahiri. He describes Zawahiri as the sole remaining ideological leader for Al-Qaeda. Okay, well, that's a factual claim that's not true. Um, so let's talk about the word ideological. The implication is that, that Zawahiri is just an ideological leader for Al-Qaeda. Well, we've already given you some of the evidence that, that his role was operational and goes far beyond just the ideological. Um He's not just an ideological leader. You know, he's the emir of Al Qaeda globally. He has these branches that are loyal to him, including Al Qaeda in the Indian subcontinent, which is in Afghanistan, and Pakistan. We talked about how he was communicating regularly, or was communicating with Asim Omar via couriers, other evidence like that. You know, the Bin Laden files. You can go through a whole bunch of different evidence to show that Zawahiri has been giving directions around the globe for a long time. Um, the idea that he's just ideological is just not true. Um, that may be driven by the fact that he's the 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 basically the voice of Al Qaeda senior leadership through Al Sahab. He's the one that they primarily focus and feature in their videos and audio messages. Okay, um, and a lot of those are ideological tracks. Yes, um, but that's not his only role. And Al Qaeda has other ideologues, has plenty of other ideologues, including in all these other regional branches. And there are other ideologues who we know of who are clerics who actually have religious credentials, unlike Zawahiri, who actually push the ideological agenda for. Al Qaeda. You have got you know we've documented. You have a guy even in Canada and London, and and you have clerics in Yemen and and um, Syria. You could point to a whole bunch of different clerics who are really the ideological backbone for Al Qaeda and putting out fatwas and that sort of thing. Um, so that's really not true. But the idea that this he's the sole remaining leader um, is this idea it implies that he's sort of the sole guy who's left from their Al Qaeda's sort of veteran cadre. Two problems with that. One, that's not true. Um, you know, we can point to guys like Saif al and Abu Muhammad al-Masri, his lieutenants who last we heard or saw, or, or last we heard, I guess, not saw, last we heard we were, were in Iran and are two of his lieutenants, both the UN and the State Department have said that these guys are playing an active role in managing Al-Qaeda globally. Those two guys that go back to the 1990s with Al-Qaeda right there, you know, and we can name, you know, I, listen, maybe at some future episode we'll do this. We can name a bunch of other guys like that in all these different theaters who are senior Al-Qaeda leaders. You have guys who we know of in Afghanistan and Pakistan. We have guys in Iran. We have guys in Syria, Yemen, Mali, Somalia. Again, all these places, veterans that go back a long way. Um, it's not at all clear how many veteran Al-Qaeda guys there are that go back to the 1990s. To my knowledge, nobody's ever produced a comprehensive listing of these individuals. Um, but the idea that Zawahiri is the only one left is just clearly factually wrong. Uh, whether it's wrong if you want to refer to him as an, just purely an ideological leader, and it's also wrong if you want to refer to him as an operational leader, right, Bill? Yeah, absolutely incorrect. I mean, you know, as you noted, we could we could spend all day just listening key senior Al Qaeda leaders who are still out there. Um, you know, you can go to Rewards for Justice if you want to browse the names of a couple of uh, of them. This statement is just completely out of touch with reality um this is something that uh, i believe this is this was said back in 2000 the same argument was made made by the obama administration right that zawahiri and one or two other key leaders were were, were out there um am i right about that tom i, I seem to recall yeah that. i think i think we had it was with uh i think marie harf was played a spokesperson yeah. role at the time and she was basically repeating the john brand talking point that zawahiri yeah. was basically the only guy left there was one or two guys left so this seems to be a talking point that sort of kicked around ODI and I for years now, and it's sort of curious, right? I mean, um, you know, I mentioned there are other a lot of other veterans we could name, right? Halid Batarfi, you know, head of AQAP, yeah, right. you know, guy who goes back to the 1990s. You know, there are guys in Shabab who have these types of similar profiles in Syria. You know, there's all sorts of guys running around. Um, but the other thing that you can point to is the fact that he's not the sole remaining leader. So he's not the sole veteran. And then they had this new generation of leadership, which we see yeah. in the Bin Laden's files. They, they wrote, they stood up to replace their fallen comrades. Um, and the Treasury Department has designated some of those, including Hamza Al Khalidi, who's the head of the military commission or was the head of Al Qaeda's military commission at one point. He was also, according to the U.S. Treasury Department on Obama in Iran, by the way. You know, he's part of the new generation. You have all sorts of guys like that you can name. So the idea that that Zawahiri is not he's not the sole remaining Al Qaeda leader, no matter how you slice it, right? No matter how you want to look at it, he's not the sole guy. And for somebody who's the head of the NCTC, 
I, you know, look, I don't want to sound arrogant, but you got to know better than that, right? Yeah. You got to have a better understanding of Al Qaeda than that. You yeah, know? Uh, Tom, think about it. If he's the sole leader of Al Qaeda, and Al Qaeda is, you know, assuming this close to defeat, they put everything in to get him, right? Yeah. Yeah, he's, he, then he's a, a true mastermind, keeping all these affil, affil, uh, branches in line and, and su- managing successful insurgencies and coordination between the two. Boy, he really he, – he's a, a, a serious multitasker if that's the case. Um, so then there's a little bit um, – oh, so we talk about the new generation leaders too, the new guys. You know, basically – let me pause here for one second. To, we know we have leader, we have uh, listeners. I'm sorry, throughout the U.S. government, in various uh, you know three academic agencies and elsewhere. I implore you, do a, a ground up assessment of Al Qaeda. Start with primary sources and figure out what this thing is, what its committees look like, uh, you know how it functions, who's on its sure council, and this sort of thing. We know a couple years ago, for example, several years ago now. That when this infighting in Syria broke out, um, these handwritten documents um, from members of Al Qaeda Shura Council came out showing the line of succession from Zawahiri. Al Qaeda was planning way back then. They knew that Zawahiri was old and could could be either killed or captured, or not captured, he'd almost certainly be killed, or die of something. Didn't know at the time that COVID was going to rise, but maybe COVID or something like that could get him, of course. Uh, they had a plan of succession in line, and they they spelled out who the guys were who were going to succeed him. Um, it's almost certainly a case they have that plan of succession today. You know, we know Saif Al-Auto and Abu Muhammad al Mazri on it. We can guess who probably are also on it today. Um, so the idea that, you know, he's just, he's it. He's the last guy and they don't, they don't have anything beyond him who's the sole remaining, he's the sole remaining guy and that's it. Just really just isn't, isn't true. And so if you're in U.S. government somewhere, just do me a favor. Don't repeat these points, these talking points like remnants or sole remaining or something like that. Bill and I have debunked it many times, but you don't have to just listen to us. Do your own thinking, do your own primary source research and analysis, and, and you can you'll stumble upon fact after fact after fact, which shows this isn't true um, at all. So after that, so after after uh, Christopher Miller, the new director of the National Counterterrorism Center, says this, um, <clears throat> after he crows that the U.S. will eventually get Zawahiri, he says, Al-Qaeda's forces, are, or he writes, are similarly in disarray and focus simply on survival. They are on the verge of collapse. It is essential for the United States to maintain focus in this final phase of a campaign that has been call, has been the calling of hundreds of thousands of Americans, often a great sacrifice. Well, we wish that were true, right? But where are they in disarray on the verge of collapse, Bill? Um, yeah. You know, we just talked about Afghanistan. They're not they're not even on the verge of collapse there, as far as we can tell. No, Tom, there, there's nowhere. At, at the very best, the, you know, there's a status quo um, where – but. You know, we've discussed this numerous times, Tom. There's an an ebb and flow to the jihad. Sometimes they're up, sometimes they're down. But we always see things equalize. Uh, the, the, I can't think of a single theater where Al Qaeda is um, has lost ground. You could argue that uh, that Iraq again. That is well, they've, lo- they've the lost one. ground. They just they, they haven't permanently out of the game. I would say. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Iraq, yeah. And, and that again was due to the split with the Islamic State. So you just basically had a replacement there. Um, but in every other thing, again, Somalia, they control 25% of well, the Well, Syria, Syria, they've got major problems. Syria, Syria they too. have major problems, but they yeah. still, you know, I would argue it, that there's a sort of a status quo there for the last several years. They sort of bottled up in Idlib, but nothing, you know, nothing seems to be happening at the moment. Um, you know, in Afghanistan, I would argue they're on the verge of victory, given that the Taliban is probably on the verge of victory. Um, we don't believe that these peace talks are are all about peace. We think the Taliban is stalling for the U.S. to withdraw and then is going to continue its fight. Yeah, there's just and 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 dare and, I know, say I, I I come back to that just on that point, Bill. So this guy, so Miller takes over an NCTC in August 10th or something along those lines, somewhere around there. Within a few days, the Defense Department Inspector General's office releases a report saying the Al Qaeda is still fighting alongside the Taliban to resurrect the Islamic Emirate yeah. of Afghanistan against the Afghan government. You know, I just and you could point to other inspector general reports, whether it be dealing with AFRICOM and what's going on with Al Qaeda throughout Africa or other parts of this, or you know, there's there's some hints in, in some of the other reports as well, but then other evidence. You know, the point is that Al Qaeda is still very active in all these theaters and 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 you know, Inspector General Office isn't saying Al Qaeda is on the verge of defeat in no. in Afghanistan, you know. Um, you know, it, it, again, all this stuff and it, it when he says they're similar Al Qaeda's forces are similarly in disarray and focused simply on survival. I'm sorry. Uh, that's not true. You know who's focused solely on survival at this point? It's the Afghan government. It's focused solely yeah. on survival. Uh, the Somali federal government is focused on some, uh, some, uh, survival. In Mali, there's a coup. The government survival is very much in jeopardy and, and problematic now. Um, 
Yemen, as you pointed out, the government there is holding on for dear life and was overthrown by the Houthis, you know? AQAP, yeah, they've had setbacks there, but, you know, we'd be surprised if they come roaring back at some point. No. So this is just, again, this is a little too cavalier for me um, and doesn't really reflect what's going on. Um, but beyond that, he says it's essential for the United States to maintain focus in this final phase of the campaign. Well, what does that even mean? How do you how do you focus on, you know, how do you define that? What are you going to do? Are you going to tell me that the, that, um, the Taliban is going to break with al-Qaeda? The State Department has promised us that or at least Secretary Pompeo and Zalmay Kalilazad have. We haven't seen it yet. We're waiting for it. Um, even then, if that happens, um, which there's no evidence for it so far, even if that happens, there's all sorts of ways that story could evolve from there. Um, so you got to tell us how that plays out. And you have to tell us the story in all these other theaters to so tell us how Al-Qaeda really is going to disintegrate. And he hasn't done that. No, he has not. And and yeah, again, I don't... This is just... This is a bravado here. It, it, he... He cannot make these arguments. And if we are focused on um, cont- maintaining the focus on, on in the final phase of the campaign, why are we drawing down from Iraq? Why are we going to withdraw from Afghanistan? If we were to maintain focus, we should be, you know, at least the status quo, at very least the status quo. We're hearing that the, the administration wants to get out of Somalia, right? That's That's been in the, in the works for, for some time. That isn't that isn't maintaining focus on the final phase of the campaign. That's getting out and and leaving these countries uh, to the wolves, essentially. So then he has uh, Miller has a few paragraphs, basically hedging against this, of course, or at least some of the language is, you know, warning against mission accomplished. You have to maintain constant pressure, the Hydra aspect of of the enemies. I mean, just read it for yourselves. We sort of think that all is, contradicts the idea that this is, you know, we're on the verge of of the de- true defeat of Al Qaeda. But let's go. Let's skip right ahead to the the the, the end here, Bill, because I know this kind of got your back up a little bit when you read this. Um, he writes, "Al Qaeda misgaged the United States' enormous resolve and fortitude. We did not seek or desire the war the terrorists started, but we will end the war on our terms. Other individuals and groups who want to harm Americans should study our war against Al Qaeda. We will pursue terrorists to the ends of the earth, never stopping until the job is done." Yeah, Tom, I, I would argue that the exact opposite has happened. Um, Al Qaeda said that it would exhaust us in, in the fight in foreign wars. And, and I think the evidence is clear that it has. I mean, the U.S. has cut a deal with the Taliban to withdraw a shameful deal that um, absolves the Taliban for its crimes of sheltering Al Qaeda both before and after 9 11. Um, it legitimizes the Taliban. Um, you know, look, the U.S. is leaving Iraq. It pulled out of Syria. It, it, it it's not ending the, the war on its own terms. It's 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 the the rhetoric of ending the endless wars is ceding the battleground to the jihadists. Um, and yeah, look, the one that I think you know when he says that the the the, the other terrorist groups should uh, study our war against al qaeda i guarantee you that they are coming to a very very different conclusion than mr miller i think what the ter- what terrorist groups have learned is that um with minimal effort they can exhaust the united states um and divide the united states on on in military action in foreign countries um these groups uh, they've shown a remarkable resiliency and and persistence it's something that you have to respect without a doubt um you know look these are evil organizations they're the you know completely 180 degrees from my worldview but you have to be able to respect your enemy um and it's an enemy that has shown that is willing to to continue the fight under long long odds and it has outlasted the united states Again, the, these terrorist groups are drawing an entirely different conclusion than Mr. Miller. Yeah, unfortunately, I agree. Uh, you know, look, again, whatever your policy preferences are, folks, whatever you want to do, whether you want the U.S. to be involved militarily or not, you know, quite frankly, I don't really care at this point, I, you know, because I'm so sick of arguing about this stuff, you know, you <laughs> yeah, are right. Too, Bill, right? Uh, yeah. I mean, I care, but I just, it just this gets to be, you know, very old arguments and sort of we're arguing about this stuff. You and I, Bill, we could have, Record this podcast nearly 10 years ago. Um, sure. In fact, we, we had this debate many years ago. Um, it's not that we don't care. We do care. But it's just sort of there are smart, smarter arguments to be made about what the U- where the U.S. is in this fight and where it's going from here. Um, this, this op-ed, I think, fell short in a lot of ways um, and uh, doesn't really explain what's going on. And um, look, I'm always willing to eat crow. 
you know, if uh, Al Qaeda were to truly disintegrate tomorrow, I will come on this podcast and say, look, hey, that I, Tom Jocelyn, got it totally wrong, and I'm going to go find a crow somewhere and barbecue that puppy and eat it up, or barbecue that bird and eat it up. Uh, but that ain't going to be the case. You know, we're not going to be wrong about this. This, this thing is going to keep going. We were right a decade ago that it was going to keep going. Um, the, the real true questions are about what degree of support America provides for local allies. Um, this op-ed seems to take it for granted that our allies have been stood up to a sufficient degree and that the U.S. is going to continue doing that to some degree. Neither one of those have actually, can you take either one of those for granted? Our allies are in trouble in different places as we stood forth and set, uh, set forth. And the U.S. is looking to cut and run, get out of this entirely. You know, the endless wars rhetoric is says that basically 2,000 Americans standing up a force of 60,000 local troops in Syria is an endless war that's un, unsustainable, unmanageable, undesirable. And that prevented ISIS from reconstituting its caliphate and ended ISIS's caliphate. I mean, if that's where you're at, then you got to basically think that, you know, America's commitment and resolve is anything but uh, strong, anything but uh, deterrent for future terrorists, which is what Mr. Miller is arguing here. Right, Bill? You leave yeah, Tom, note? I could not agree with you anymore. I think that's a, a great place for us to end this. Um, you really hit the nail on the head there. Well, thank you for listening to this week's episode of Generation Jihad. Please do subscribe to the show. As a reminder, you can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or anywhere else you listen to your shows. And we will see you again next week.